All right. I have 1102, so we're going to go get ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. This is the very first day, very first workshop of the 30-day challenge um, brought to you by the Borkter Center for Calling and Career. Um, you are in the right place if you're here to learn about resumes and CVs. Um, this presentation will go to about 1150. Um, if you have to log off before that, no worries. We will be recording the presentation and make sure that you um, are sent the recap of everything today. Um, so again, welcome to the 30 day challenge and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Megan Schelt and I am the assistant director in the Borkter Center for Calling and Career. Um, I'm joined by um, one of our alumni employer partners, Keegan Aguilera, the class of 2012, um, who's gonna be sharing some great information on what recruiters look for, um, and some other helpful pieces of information on resumes. Um, so with that, I'm gonna make sure that he can introduce himself, share a little bit about his HOPE experience. So welcome, Keegan. Awesome, thanks, Megan. Um, I appreciate everyone joining in. It, it's an opportunity and I, we're gonna to touch on some of that stuff. I talk about building your brand and getting your name out there and networking and, and leveraging the resources and tools that you have, right? I think that's one of the things I love about Hope College and why I'm always happy to do these types of things. So um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in Freeland, Michigan. If you don't know where that is, it's around Midland, somewhat close to the Mount Pleasant area. I was very fortunate to uh, find Hope College. My older sister actually went. So I got to go for a siblings weekend and that was my first experience. But uh, I had some fun facts around having seven siblings growing up on a farm. Um, that's kind of what drove me to join corporate America and really uh, dive into the staffing and services industry, which <clears throat> to the topic of today helps a lot around resume building and building your own network and, and brand. So, um, and, and a lot of that was foundationally shaped at Hope. Uh, you know, just my Hope experience, I talked about it a little bit as far as the lacrosse and football, uh, the athletics were a great piece of it, but quite honestly, the, the major business management, you get access to a lot there. So I was able to really figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and then my minors, uh, leadership and communication. I think I was the third or fourth year of that minor. And Megan and I were talking yesterday about how that program's evolved and, and what I took from that. So um, those are some of the, the educational side of it. But the other piece too, I was fortunate to work for the Dow as a supervisor for three years. So opening that place up and closing it um, all through the school year, as well as the summers, had a great time there. Um, my only negative experience was probably the summer camps when it was 90 degrees and, and no AC in that building, but hey, we all lived. So uh, I did that. And then obviously an internship. I had an internship with Downtown Holland where I really got to put on any event that Downtown Holland did. I was a part of from a marketing event coordinating standpoint. Quite honestly, one of my favorite jobs up to this point. I wish it could have been a full-time job, but had a great experience really diving into to hope. So, um, and then from my career, I was, I was hired into the staffing and services industry by tech systems. Um, whether you guys heard of them or not, heavily recruit um, hope grads out of there. I was one of those in 2012. I was a recruiter, IT specific recruiter here in Grand Rapids. They asked me if I was open to moving and initially I was kind of nervous to do it, but I always knew I could come back home. And that's what's so cool about this, this message is if you look at my track, my, my goal was to always come back to, to West Michigan. I fell in love with it, took a little piece of my heart, and we knew that this is where we wanted to be. You can see the picture in the right with my wife, Ricky, who's a 2014 grad, uh, and then my son, Kingston, and my daughter, Mila. So uh, we just moved back in October uh, and throughout my career heavy, heavy sales based. And then I got to, to be in some leadership. And later on, I'll talk a little bit more about what I'm doing here with Beacon Hill Technologies, but um, just really excited to be back. And, and thanks for having me do this with you, Megan. Awesome, thanks. So what are we gonna talk about today? Um, we're gonna talk about when to use a CV or curriculum vitae, if you've never heard that acronym before, and when to use a resume. Um, what sections should you be including in those documents? Construction of formatting of those things, how to write strong bullet points, personal branding, and Keegan's really gonna dive into what recruiters look for from his 
professional perspective. So let's kick it off um, resume versus CV. When should you be using um, each type of document? So a resume as you'll hear from many people in the Borkter Center is a one page document. Um, unless you're an education major, we allow you to have two, um, but you're typically going to use a resume for your internship search, post-grad job search. Um, if you're currently going through the process of applying to be an RA, you might use it for an on-campus job. Um, and there might be some certain uh, volunteer or philanthropic organizations that may want you to submit a resume to participate. So our resume um, emphasizes your professional qualifications and activities. The, the title of today's talk was You on Paper, and that's exactly what a resume and a CV is. Um, it captures your experiences, your leadership, um, the things you're involved in your community or here at Hope College, um, so it's a snapshot. A CV is slightly different. Um, if you're working with a professor, they're probably gonna refer to a CV. This could be two um, or more pages most students we work with are in the two page category. You're going to use a CV when you're applying to graduate school. And this is really heavy in the health professions, um, research or oriented programs. Um, if you are an international student or you're going to be applying internationally for a fellowship or job opportunity, you're most likely going to be um, using a CV. That's a more universal standard document. Um, so different from a resume, a CV is going to go a little bit deeper into lab skills, um, professional development, um, things that you're doing more comprehensively in the world of research. Um, now, you can highlight some of those things on your resume, but CVs are really going to go in depth about where did you present this project? What were you trying to research? What are your research interests as well? So let's talk about sections that you should be including specifically on a resume. So you're gonna have your contact information. This is your first and last name, what you like to be called by the recruiter, um, your phone number. So this should be your typically your cell phone, the one that you're gonna answer when that recruiter calls you for that screening or to set up an interview, your email. And for all seniors, make sure you're using a non-HOPE email so when you make that transition, employers can contact you. Um, and then I do see people who put their LinkedIn um, link directly in their header as well. So that's an option. Or if you have a professional portfolio that you want um, an employer to see, you could link to that as well. And you can have an objective that's optional but, uh, that should be really targeted not be a long summary about who you are to maybe three sentences max um, of what you're trying to target and a little bit about you. Then it's going to come your education section. So this is Hope College. If you went on to grad school and got a master's later on, you'd add that there. Study abroad, your GPA, what you're majoring in um, and minors, and then Dean's List or other things that are appropriate to add towards your education. After that, the sections are gonna be different from student to student. So these could be relevant coursework. Uh, maybe if you don't have an internship just yet, adding relevant coursework could be helpful for that employer to know your background. Um, this could be experiences, so work um, experiences or relevant experience. Experience when you're working with the Borgter Center staff is gonna be paid or unpaid work. So if you volunteered somewhere for four years and maybe you're in a leadership role, that's great experience you should be highlighting um, on that document and not hiding it at the bottom where you might be putting some other um, volunteer experience. College and community involvement. What do we mean by that? Community involvement could be things here in the HOPE community, but it also means stuff from back home. Maybe you've gone on some mission trips with your church. Maybe you were um, involved in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. You could be putting that stuff in there. Honors and awards. So again, this is where you could highlight Dean's List, scholarships, or maybe an award related to the department that you're a part of. And then skills. Skills need to be related to the program or job you're applying for. We want to make sure that skills are measurable. We see so many students will put responsible as a skill. I'm sure you're really responsible, but tell me how you're responsible in a bullet point versus pulling that out as a skill. So with skills, we tend to see hard skills, languages you know how to speak in your level of fluency, Photoshop, social media, if that job requires it, 
things that you can perform is what we would tell students there. So a CV again is going to incorporate a lot of the things from that resume, but flesh out a little bit more in detail. So again, you're going to have that contact information. You're going to have an objective. If you're applying to grad school and you want to do research, that objective should talk about the type of research you want to be doing at that institution. A summary of qualifications, typically it's what we're going to see for a, a college professor. So you may not have that section. Education again, coursework, honors, a research section. So this is where you're going to talk about maybe the summer research program that you did. Technical or lab skills, experiences, internships, your TA, that's a great place to highlight that. And then again, college and community involvement. The last section on there is professional development. Maybe you were blessed with the opportunity to go to a conference during your time at Hope and present. Maybe you went um, a step further with that professor and their work was published. You're a co-author of that research, um, putting that stuff in there. So as you can see with all of these sections, um, you're gonna have a two, maybe three page document. I personally love working with CVs. So please come see us in the Borkter Center set up an appointment and we are happy to go through this document. And um, Keegan too, these are alumni. Our alumni are willing to give you a lot of good advice specific to their industry, um, things that maybe their company would say, hey, we're looking for that in a candidate. That might help you um, tweak your document and maybe something that was at the bottom now moves to the top um, because you get some insider information as well. So use our alumni network to get some feedback there too. So construction of formatting. Um, this is one element to not overlook. We want a clean, simple document, um, depending on the position you're applying for. If you're applying in the world of art, graphic design, we might have something a little bit more visually appealing. Um, so know your audience, but strive for simplicity and keep it clean. Your margins should all be the same size. Um, your font sizes should be consistent. If I choose to bold all my job titles, those should be consistent throughout. So streamline that document. We see a lot of students who make the mistake of aligning their dates on the wrong side. Um, they should be right aligned to the margin. Your dash sizes should all be the same size. So those are little things that people will look for, um, especially if it's a detail-oriented position. And then check your work. Don't underestimate spell check. Make sure that you've spelled out your acronyms. Word does not automatically spell check anything that's in all capital letters. So I typically see experience or involvement spelled wrong on students' documents as well. The, the Bork Center um, has some great resources for you to check out. Um, we have an action verb list. We have a how-to guide that's gonna capture everything we're talking about today. Uh, we have example resumes and CVs by major. And you can access all of that information um, through the resources section of Handshake. We've made them all Google Docs on purpose. That way you can copy our templates if you choose um, and have a great setup for formatting um, as well. I would, can tell you, and Keegan can probably attest, formatting a lot of people have a challenge with if you're not used to constructing these documents. I personally recommend not starting with a template because sometimes there's templates that are out there that put your information in the wrong spot. Um, so we really wanna start from a blank Word document. You can easy, easily transition and copy and paste to make different versions of this document as you tailor. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, please reach out to Borkter Center. Again, set up that appointment and we're happy to work with you. Yeah, the, the one I wanna add is that when, when she's talking about the construction formatting and leveraging the resources that you have, it's so critical to do that from the first step. Don't do that later or, you know, you're just going to double work. So that's my biggest encouragement of one being in an industry where I look at 100 resumes a day. Um, do it on the front end. So you're set up to her point where you can customize and change little things that will take you 30 seconds versus this front end work that, yeah, it might be a couple hours. But once you have that done, you've got a format that you can change within a matter of seconds. So that's my biggest thing. Just do it right the first time and, and you'll be set up. Yeah, absolutely. Key thing is tailor, tailor, tailor. You're probably going to have three, maybe four versions of your resume or CV, depending on the industry you're applying in. 
Um, and that is critical. You should be using language from that job description, um, incorporating that in your document. So let's talk quickly about applicant tracking systems or an ATS. Um, bigger companies, your Fortune 500, your Steelcases, your Herman Millers, large companies that hire 100 to 200 applicants per position, um, even for internships as well, that are competitive, um, they might use something called an applicant tracking system. That's a computer system your resume is going to go into first before a human HR person is going to see that document. And ATS is going to flag for keywords and it wants a clean format. So if you're using symbols, pictures, color, um, certain types of columns, applicant tracking systems have a harder time reading those types of documents. Um, so make sure it represents you. You can change your font style, um, but we want to make sure that it's pretty clean and consistent um, as well. So we have two different examples of resumes on here. On the left, you'll see Millie Maxwell is a more artistic um, resume. Key things here when you're using color, be careful with your color. You don't want to be distracting from you. So this is a really tasteful, not super in your face type of document. And again, this is going to be for our studio art majors, graphic design, maybe some of our comm majors might lean into something towards the left. On the right, we have Amy Parker. This is your standard clean document. This is going to be for accounting, biology, some of our more standard um, professional degrees. Both of these documents are equally valuable, so you have to represent your personal brand, which Keegan will talk about, um, but just know the audience and the person that's going to be looking at this document. Sometimes you can stand out in a bad way if you go too graphic. Um, so remember, this is your first impression. The goal of your resume is to get the interview. Um, so remember, this is your first impression. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Keegan for his portion of our presentation. And again, if you've got any questions as we're going through, drop them into the chat and we'll be sure to answer those either in the moment or wait for the end as well. Awesome. Yeah, I, I should have uh, pulled my old resume as a joke um, just to show you guys in, in mirror nine years later, um, my resume looks exactly like that one on the right. And a lot of the individuals that I work with, it, it's, it's a simple format. It gets the job done. You don't have to um, make it too fancy or grab an eye to Megan's point where it's going to take away from your actual experience that's on that resume. I think, like you said, the one on the left definitely gears more towards skill sets or um, jobs that you're going after. But yeah, I just thought it was funny. I looked at that resume and I was like, oh, that kind of looks like mine. <laughs> so um, I appreciate it, guys. So I wanted to hit on writing strong bullet points. I kept it simple because it truly is. You don't have to complicate this. Um, but you want to be detail oriented, as Megan mentioned. So I always said specific. Uh, well, let's hit on that. The, the bullet points that you want to have in there um, may reflect the skills section. I think that's a, a big um, correlation in my industry when we're looking at resumes every day, trying to identify, hey, does this person fit this job? We're going to look at those bullet points and say, hey, what were they doing specifically on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and you just wanna, you wanna map it out. I, some people will say, okay, is it three bullet points? Is it five? Megan and I talked about, hey, is it one page? Is it two page? If this experience is relevant and specific to the job you did, put it in there. Always get a second opinion. Always have third opinions, fourth opinions, have people read it, um, get it out to different eyes just to get perspective and feedback. But if it's something you did, put it on there. The other um, big thing that we see in our industry is the I versus we. If there is any verbiage or language in that uh, bullet point that says, we did this or we were building, there's nothing wrong with that. But what it does is it discredits you as the individual applying for that job. You want to say, hey, I take some ownership. I think this is the one time where it's okay to to be a little proud of the work that you did because to her point and where our industry is going with applicant tracking systems, that's what we do as IT. So a lot of the times we're even working with companies to build their, their applicant tracking system. 
um, it is going to pick up on those buzzwords. It's going to pick up on very specific nitty gritty details that you'll dive in later in a conversation, but you wanna have it in there and you wanna have it be I. This is what you did, this is what you owned. So have some confidence in that message and don't shortchange yourself and only have one or two bullet points. Um, if it's seven and it's all that you did, put it in there. Um, and then lastly, just relevant. Um, I think it was a mistake I made early on when I started to apply for jobs. I had my standard resume and that was it. I blasted that thing out to a bunch of jobs. I'm like, all right, let's get ready for these interviews. And I think I applied for maybe 18, 19, um, that first semester, my senior year at Hope. And I only got like probably three or four interviews. Looking back and the experience that I have in this industry now, I'm like, yeah, I didn't tailor that to those jobs. Have it be relevant. If you need to go back and switch a bullet point or switch your skill section because that job is requiring something very specifically that you're like, you know what? I did do that. Um, go back and, and spend a couple minutes changing some of those things because it matters. When, when recruiters are looking at this, after an applicant tracking system already qualified or disqualified you, that's step one. Step two is a recruiter will on average look at your resume less than 60 seconds. I think it's actually 45 to 48 seconds is how fast they'll look at it. So if it's relevant to that job and they can see it, it's going to matter. So don't take for granted that every job is going to be different. That's awesome information. And what I would add to that as well is we kind of have a formula that we recommend that students use in the Borkter Center. And again, you're going to hear different opinions on this, but we should, the bullet point should hit three different parts. The first part should be a strong action verb or buzzword. Typically, these are right in that job or internship description. Make sure it's in the proper tense. If you're currently doing something, present tense is not ing, it's create versus creating. Second part, um, is a activity task. What were you doing? Again, what's relevant and specific to the role. And the third part, and he can probably tell you the most important is results. Why that thing was important and what impact did it have? Yeah, I, I think the results piece is huge to the, hey, if that's something you owned, well, what was the end result? And can you tell me? And they'll be able to figure out, hey, was it you specifically based on how in detail you can go with those results? So that's a good point. Um, next thing I wanted to hit on was personal branding and the power of moments. Um, power of moments, if you guys ever heard it, it's a book. Uh, Megan, I, I don't know if we talked about this. It's a phenomenal book, but it, it's also more of a methodology around every interaction that you have in every conversation, um, every email, every social media, like you got to think where we are at now in society there's a power of moment in that where you can impact someone positively, neutral or negative. And that all comes back to personal branding. So I kind of put this into six topics and it's funny as I thought about it, this is more my brand, right? This is what I talk about. And this is kind of how I try to live my life personally and professionally. When does it start, right? Your personal branding started a long, long time ago. It was probably the first job, the first part-time thing that you did, whether it was cash only or an actual job. Um, you got to think you started working somewhere where optimistically you're going to have a reference, someone that's going to validate and give you credibility for what you did. And I think back, my, my personal branding probably started around 11 or or 12 when I started working for my grandpa and some of his friends around the farms in the mid Michigan area. Um, so mine goes back to when I was 11 or 12 is where mine started. So you got to think through those interactions. Did you have a positive one with someone or did you get great feedback from someone where as you're sitting on this, this, uh, this zoom call, when's the last time you talked to that person? When's the last time you talked to an old boss that hired you three, four years ago and said thank you or give them appreciation for what they did? I think about it all the time. The people that I had in my internships in high school, college, downtown Holland, every now and then I'll just shoot them a note and say, hey, thank you for the reference that you gave for the next opportunity. Because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be sitting here today having this conversation. So I'm big on that stuff. Um, 
And then as you take that, it goes into the next bucket. I, I put awareness around SWOT. If you guys don't know what a SWOT analysis is, um, in our industry especially, but I think a lot of corporate companies, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, they'll look at this. SWOT stands for strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. And this is a self-assessment. The most successful people that I've ever worked with, uh, personal life, sports, or professional, have the best awareness about themselves. They know when to leverage their strengths. They know when to work on their weaknesses. And I don't even like the word weakness. I usually say areas of opportunity. Um, they know what that opportunity looks like. And then a threat saying, hey, um, threat could be competitive landscape. If you're interviewing for a job, okay, well, do you know who you're up against? How many resumes? I don't know if you guys know this, but on average in the first 48 hours, the average I believe is 78 resumes for a job. So to this whole topic of conversation, how do you set yourself apart? Um, it's having great awareness, putting that specific experience in there. When she was talking about the skills, is there something in there that is a strength for you that is measurable? If so, put it in there. Cause I think this matters a lot when you have great self-awareness. The next bucket here is be known for what you know. Someone told me that in my first year uh, when I worked for tech systems, which is you know industry leading staffing and um, services company in the world. And he told me, he's like, hey, be known for what you know. I was kind of a young gun, big aspirations. I wanted to be in leadership. I wanted the titles and you know all of these things that come with that. But when it was all said and done, the better I got good with being known for what I knew and not trying to be all knowing or the smartest person in the room or the most intelligent, I was none of those things. But if I knew what I was really good at in that experience, not only could I speak to, but also was in my resume. So when I'm sitting across from someone, they're like, hey, tell me about this. I had such confidence and conviction with what I did. That's part of your brand. And, and that message will be spread across whoever you come in contact with. So you don't always have to be the smartest. You don't always have to be the most intelligent or the best. Um, just be good at what you're being good at. And you got to have confidence in that. That's something I struggled early on in my career. And once I once I finally came to terms with that, um, I saw a lot of success. For me, the, the 124 rule, this is kind of an old school corporate thing, which I still think holds a ton of value. When you talk about personal branding, it's 124. So in one day, you have 24 hours. If you receive communication, right? And let's just use the example of you apply to a job. You got the automatic email response or a recruiter actually reached out to you. My biggest advice is reach out as soon as you can. Don't wait. This isn't a, hey, I got it on a Friday. I'll get to it Monday morning. Um, that's your brand. And recruiters do look at stuff like that. So if you're responding in 24 hours or less, I think that's the best customer service that you can have. And that goes anywhere. It doesn't matter what industry you're in what job you're applying for, that's going to show um, the type of person that they're going to potentially hire. So that's my big thing. Resp or respond as fast as you can in an efficient manner and get that communication back. Um, and then that kind of goes into consistent follow-up. If, if you're communicating back and forth, um, I've been hiring for going on six years now. And I can't lie, uh, if someone doesn't respond within that 24 hours or has spotty communication or the, hey, sorry, I missed you a few days ago, I'll give you a call back. I don't know, it doesn't always sit well with me because then I have to think as an employer, how is this person gonna represent us when they go out into the field? So again, have consistent communication. If you get in contact with talent acquisition, uh, procurement, a recruiter, anyone, um, just be very, very consistent and thorough with your communication because that plays a big factor because then that hiring manager is going to go back and say, hey, how were they, right? Recent college grads, some people might have an internship, some might not. So they might leverage those references, but they're also going to ask that recruiter, how was your communication? So, um, and then be intentional. As you're building your brand, I always, uh, I, I hinted towards it a little bit around reaching back out to those people. If you have intentional communication, uh, people are going to remember that. 
you don't have to have a special or a fancy story to tell, but if you were intentional, employers will see that come through. Um, so just make sure every interaction, whether it's an email, a call, be prepared, uh, be intentional, and it's just going to continue to strengthen your brand. Um, and then lastly, uh, one big thing I want to hit on, as I've already been talking about, is the re recruiters look for. Megan said it, it starts with a buzzword, but it doesn't end there. Um, so get those buzzwords in your resume. If it's something that you saw in a job description and you were like, hey, I've done that before, get that specific phrase or topic into the system. The system we use and, and even the system I use with my previous employer, um, within seconds, we can figure out every buzzword. There's a, there's a right click, a highlight, and it highlights every single thing on someone's resume. So when you talk about that 45 second look at a resume, that's why we can do it. Because if it doesn't have the buzzwords, chances are you didn't either fully read the job description or you didn't put enough detail in your resume to reflect the job that I am hiring for. So we'll look over it. So starts with the buzzwords. It doesn't always end there, but make sure those are in there. Um, what those recruiters are looking for are consistent themes or patterns. Um, that's why I think doing the resume focused on the front end is going to save you a lot of time because if it's consistent, if there's patterns, hey, the formatting, all the everything's lined up, bullet points are lined up. Um, it's like, okay, someone took enough time to care about this and put this information from my job description, maybe in their resume of how they did that, it's going to matter. Um, and then one thing that I really didn't, I, I wasn't told this, and I think I just learned it through being in the industry, referral based uh, is critical if you have an opportunity to do that. Megan had mentioned the, the LinkedIn, right? Get your LinkedIn up and running. If you have it, put it on your resume. I think that's huge. You don't have to have a ton of experience or be a LinkedIn guru to have a, a LinkedIn profile. Um, if you have that, it allows you to connect with people at that organization or people that are doing that very specific job, which for you, connect with them and say, hey, I just applied for this job. I'm curious, tell me the real day-to-day -day details. Now you're starting to network. Now this is bringing this full circle around building your brand because optimistically that person goes and says, hey, um, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Manager, I know you have that job posting up. Um, this lady, Megan Shell, she just reached out to me and was asking about the job. Did she apply for that? Yeah, her resume is right here out of the 75 that I just got in the last two days. Boom, you just got your resume pulled out and you're probably going to get a different look. So I always say it's funny. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, and sometimes that applies. And, and I always joke that I don't know if that flies in the medical field saying, I want to be a doctor, I'm going to be a doctor because of who I know doesn't exactly work like that, but it does pay off when you can connect with people in the industry, at that job, at that organization. That's where networking really comes in. And quite honestly, you know, working in Chicago, here, Indianapolis, Southern California, um, Grand Rapids and West Michigan does a great job at what that looks like and how you network with people. So I'm a firm believer, you can go anywhere and this will pay off. If you can connect with people prior to even having someone look at your resume, it's pretty important. Um, and then if contacted, have confidence in your story. Um, this is something that I, I worked on for the first few years of my professional career. The, hey, tell me about yourself question. That starts with the resume because what they're going to try to figure out. And when I talked about those consistent patterns or themes, when they see your resume, the stuff that we are going to have a conversation about in the next 30 minutes on that initial interview, does that reflect what you have in your resume? Because if there's some red flags or some completely different stories being told, it's going to raise some concern and, in, in, you know, that's something that probably won't work out. So have confidence in your story have those details in your resume. So then when you get to that point, the story is natural and it's easy for you. You don't have to make everything up. Um, and that's also a big mistake where people try to tailor their story to something, which 
bring some relevant information, but just be confident with who you are because a lot of times they're hiring you. They're not hiring um, someone they want you to be. That's great advice. So we've got plenty of time. We've got about 10 minutes for, for questions. So um, you have the ability to unmute yourself um, if you want to answer or ask the question live to myself or Keegan, or if you feel more comfortable dropping it into the chat, please go ahead and do that. So I'll give everyone a couple minutes to think about their question um, and we'll go ahead and answer those for you. And while everyone is um, thinking of their question, um, one thing that we hear a lot from students is how do I follow up and how much time should I be following up after I submit an application? They're so excited about the role. Maybe it's been a week. Do, when, when should you be following up? What's annoying to a recruiter um, to express your interest and would love your insight there? That's a, that's a great question. It's a question that I've, I've gotten every week of the last eight and a half years in this industry. Um, there's no right answer, but what I will tell you is when you apply, whether you have a direct communication, try to set the right expectations from the front end. If you have a conversation say, hey, I'm applying to this, or they said, yeah, go ahead and apply. My next question is always, okay, I plan to apply tonight. Um, what are realistic expectations on when I'm gonna hear back? If you don't have the opportunity to ask that question, then I would continue to follow up until you get some form of communication. In our industry, as a recruiter, and I was only a recruiter for about 15 months, but then in Orange County I actually led a team of 30 recruiters. Um, there is no such thing as being bugged too much. That shows initiative that shows that you care, that it's something that you're you're interested in, that you want. And I had recruiters like, man, this guy won't leave me alone. He reached out to me three times today and two yesterday. I look at that and I'm like, why is that a bad thing? Sounds like this guy's really interested in this job. How do you stack rank him versus these other people? So um, to answer it is, is efficient in that communication as you can be and set the right expectations. If it's every day until you hear back, there's nothing wrong with that because it happens all the time. If you think, oh, I'm probably the one that just keeps bugging this guy, you're not, you're not. So take advantage of that. Great. I have a question. Go ahead, Ethan. Um, so how valuable is it to include it that an experience or involvement uh, took place during COVID-19? Like, is that something that can have an edge, but since everybody went through it, is it something we don't include or like, what do you think? Yeah, give me, give me an example there. You're saying if you, if you accomplished something during COVID-19 or you worked during COVID-19? Yeah. So like I had an internship during COVID-19 last summer. So like, is there any value in seeing like, oh, I accomplished this and still like overcame the COVID-19 regulation restrictions and like working on a team even through that and like. Yeah, I think we, we all went through it, right? The entire world went through that change and transformation of how companies are set up to hire, to train, to develop, to get work done. Um, so one, I'd want that experience to be shown on a resume, but two, to answer your question, I would almost tailor that to what did you take away? Like, how did you grow or develop through that experience, right? For me, and this is what I, if I was making a resume, I'd put in there, was able to remotely train and lead 30 people, um, you know, during this period of time. It doesn't have to say COVID-19. It doesn't have to be that because we all did it. But if you can say, this is what I learned to do or the skills I developed during that time, put that in there. Thank you. I would also add, Ethan, um, talking about how you're flexible and adaptable given the circumstances can be really critical. Um, employers want people that are coachable, that don't come to the job knowing everything, but are flexible, adaptable, and coachable. So if you can relate any of your bullet points to maybe moving a whole event or program online when you had to, to pivot so quickly, those are great skill sets to um, show that employer. 
It, I'm so glad you said that. You took the words out of my mouth because I was like, crap, I got to talk about coachable. And so thank you for hitting on that because I've got a criteria of eight things that I look for and coachable is one of them. So to that point, if you can show it, that's really what they're looking for in, in recent college grads. A few questions in the chat. So um, first one is from Maggie who says, should high school academics be included within the education section if we're still in undergrad? Um, Maggie, great question. I would say if you are a freshman, it's still okay to have high school on there. But I can tell you it's not gonna matter after that. Um, so I would say second semester, freshman year and forward, you can remove high school with one exception. Maybe you know the hiring manager, the recruiter, whoever's, you know, owns the company even went to your high school. Put that on there. That's a small networking connection that you can make. Um, I see it. I see high school come a lot over. You're so proud of high school graduating with honors, whatever it may be. And um, you should put that on there if you're proud of it. But but no, they're really just going to care about the degree that you're currently seeking or are going to graduate with. So I would probably remove it after first semester freshman year. Um, so the next question, um, Keegan, I'll let you answer is, how much of your educational achievements should you include on your resume? So um, need input, is this conducting research, any awards or projects? How do you know when you have too much on there um, that they're really not gonna be looking at your experience? Yeah, I, I think this, this section is important because it shows the maybe some things that you did that you went above and beyond, right? How do you separate yourself or differentiate yourself? This could be a section of that. I just wouldn't get too wordy. I would have this more be, you know, unless it was a project base where you need to go into um, specific examples or bullet points of what you what you accomplished in that project. Keep in mind the I versus we, right? This is a great example or someone said, we did this, we did that. Okay, well, how big was the team? Well, there was eight of us on that project. Okay, so eight of you did this. So the role that you played sounds kind of small, right? You don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, just I. I, I was able to accomplish this during a project, some research. Um, awards, 100%, 100%. Um, you should always have that in there. You don't have to talk about what the award was because as an employer, I'm going to be curious. I'm going to ask, hey, what was X award that you got? T tell me about that. Uh, and then because you are confident in your story, you can go right into detail. So I'd say for this section, not a lot of detail. Be very direct and pointed and set yourself up to elaborate on it, if that makes sense. Um, I would say too, Aiden, if you um, have quite a bit of educational achievements, think about if you're leaning towards a curriculum vitae where that should be a lot of detail as well, depending on your field. So again, go back in those slides and we send them over and decide which category you're in for, for resume or CV and um, more information can be included in that section. Um, so Keegan, this one's for a recruiter's perspective. So this one's from Megan. Um, what advice would you give someone who applied to multiple internships but hasn't been offered a position? Uh, Megan's tailored a resume to each role, understands that internships are competitive and would just love your perspective um, on standing out and securing that internship. Great question. Great question. I, th I think even in the start of my story, I, this exact boat I was in, and the one thing I didn't do that looking back, I wish I did. And I think technology has really changed so much in the last 10 years to allow us to do this. But that's where I was hinting towards, hey, if you haven't heard back, connect with people via LinkedIn, any way you can get to them. The alumni network is a big one that I didn't think about. And looking back, I'll use my example. I wanted the one of the highly touted internships at Universal Forest Products. Guess what? That was started by all Hope College grads. Guess what I didn't do? I didn't connect with Hope College alumni uh, for that internship. Um, I also had a LinkedIn, but guess what I didn't do? I didn't connect with the people hiring for those internships, the people that have done those internships, because that experience is going to be on someone's LinkedIn profile. So you can say, hey, Megan, I saw you did this three years ago. How was it? Who did you work for? Are they still there? Would you be able to connect me with that person? There's so many networking avenues that you can go about. Um, if you have not heard back, 
that's my biggest thing. I just had someone actually who he just, he's, he's getting his doctorate in biomedical science, but has never actually worked, right? This guy is super smart, but he's like, hey, I've applied for these. What do I do? He's my age. He's actually also a Hope grad, um, Nate Love ran track. And uh, I told him, I was like, hey, have you connected with all these people at that organization or company? He's like, no. And I was like, that's where you got to start. Um, and who knows, maybe they'll look at it, maybe they, not, they won't, but you're setting yourself up to have more lines of communication outside of just the recruiter. Because if those people can help and speak and refer you to the people that are hiring for it, that's going to be more powerful than a recruiter doing it, if I'm being honest with you. Yes, 69% of jobs and internships are found through networking. Um, so shameless plug, we have um, LinkedIn support through the Borkter Center, as well as a new system called the Hope College Connection. Um, Connection.hope.edu will get you right there. And that is a database of alumni who are just waiting for you to reach out to them um, to get connected. Um, so another question in the chat um, from Peter, should we include a more informal about me section um, on my resume. Um, so Peter, I'll, I can kick it off and Keegan, feel free to chime in too. Um, I don't see about me sections a ton. Um, my, my personal opinion, you're gonna hear multiple um, viewpoints on this is to not include it um, because the goal of your resume is to get that interview where you can be answering that question. You're also gonna be able to submit a cover letter and you should be submitting a cover letter with every application. That gives you an opportunity to talk about yourself. Um, you don't want to give the employer too much. Um, you don't want to be so informal in that about me section. It can come off unprofessional and, and there's, a, there's a fine line that can be kind of tricky writing. And you're just wasting valuable real estate on that document where you could be talking about those internships, those key experiences at Hope um, that the employer really cares about. Um, so it's not incorrect, um, but I would personally think that there are more valuable uses for that space. I don't know, Keegan, if you want to add. I 100% I agree. I don't think I would have said it any different. Um, the about me stuff shouldn't be in the objective. You can maybe have a line or I've seen it where people are very pointed with a job and said, hey, I'm an aspiring future salesperson with that has the expectations to bring XYZ to your company. Um, and maybe you highlight some attributes that you have that you think would be valuable. But that is like a one sentence thing that you put in the objective specific to the job. There's, there doesn't need to be a, an about me. That, to your point, is a cover letter or something that will come up in the conversation within an interview. So uh, I definitely, I would encourage you to not have that there. All right, so we are coming up on 1150 and we have got one more question. So we're gonna go ahead and answer it for you, Ellie. Um, and if you have to go to class, I know it's the end of community hour, feel free to log off. We've got the recording, we'll send it to you. Um, please make sure that you are going into Handshake. There are so many other 30 day challenge workshops coming up, personal branding, personal finance. Um, we have somebody from TikTok coming. So lots of cool stuff coming up. Um, but we're gonna end with Ellie's question. She said, can you uh, talk about cover letters and what should we include on them? So Ellie, number one, on our website, hope.edu backslash Borkter, we have an awesome cover letter guide. I'm just gonna go through the 30 second cover letter. What should you include? First part is gonna be your intro. This is the who, what, when, where, why. Who I am, what I'm applying for, why I'm applying and your excitement. Second two paragraphs are called your argument paragraphs. You are arguing why you are the best fit for that role, position, internship, whatever it may be. This is typically we're going to pick maybe a few things off your resume to expand about and tell your story. So remember what Keegan said, I versus we. You're talking about yourself. You're using first person, incorporating your skill set when you're telling your story. And the last part is your closing, reiterating your interest in the role, how you plan to follow up or would like the employer to follow up and signing it off. It's a one page document, four to five paragraphs in what's called black format, meaning you don't indent your paragraphs. Again, great examples on the Borg Deer Center website. Um, we see appointments for cover letters. They're kind of tricky at first. Um, I recommend start with your resume. You have a great idea of um, where you can go with that cover letter. And again, we can offer you support for the Borg Deer Center. So with that, um, Keegan, thank you for being here and sharing your insight. And thanks to everyone for logging on today for our, our kickoff workshop. 
Um, he can put his contact information in the slides. We'll get those out. Feel free to reach out to him, pick his brain. He'd love to do that. Um, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the 30 day challenge. Thanks for having me, Megan. I appreciate it. Please reach out if you have questions.